So, does anybody have any questions? All right, so we got a little work left in the money market. What did we leave up with last time? Not the money market, the bond market, which is going to lead us to the bond money market. So we have supply and demand for bonds. Deficit, supply shifters, yeah. All right, so all of that was what we call the asset demand theory for the bond market. And today we're going to start off with um, the liquidity preference from John Maynard Keynes. They might remember Keynes. What do you remember from Keynes for macro class? Keynes. What? He's dead? It's not what he said, but it's true. It is true. He is dead, yeah. He, he did say Sonic. Yeah, Hayek and him had the battle. He also said, in the long run, we're all dead. Yeah, we're all dead. Uh, so let's let's do some action now. So that was our John Maynard Keynes. So just to refresh ourselves a little bit first, let's uh, think about our bond market. So what were we measuring on the vertical axis? Interest rate slash price of the bond. It can go back and forth. So usually we are actually measuring the price of the bond, which the one uh, slide from your uh, uh, that I showed from the textbook uh, had the interest rate associated with it. So remember, the price of the bond and the interest rate are directly related to each other. So you can, by saying one, you're kind of saying the other. And what was their relationship with each other? <laughs> price of bonds and interest rate. Inverse. Negatively, relation, negative re negatively related. Interest rates go up, price of bonds go down, vice versa. So the inverse relationship between the price of bonds and the interest rate. So bonds are an IOU that can be drafted by governments, corporations, you know, potentially more or less individuals, but the ones that are financial securities that are traded in the marketplace uh, are uh, government bonds and corporate bonds are the ones that we deal with for this, uh, for this section. And so the interaction of sellers and buyers of bonds gives us some sort of equilibrium price on Wall Street. Uh, bonds and a certain volume of trade. Alright, so then we went over shifters and so we can be uh, bond demand going up, going to raise uh, price. And so the key thing for your homework and test type problems is generally thinking about the bond market. If there's an increase in demand for bonds, what happens to interest rates? If bond demand increases, what happens to interest rates? Higher? I heard a lower? I'm kind of trying to trick you because you need to remember, start remembering that inverse relationship. As bond demand increases, what's happening here to interest rates? They're getting lower and lower and lower, but why is my golf club going higher and higher and higher? Because this is the price of bonds, right? So you'll see questions like that as an increase in bonds. So you kind of have to have this memorized, have this picture memorized. And specifically, always, as always, look at your axes on what you're measuring. And remember, this is the price of bonds. So then you've got this extra level of detail that your brain has to remember. Because hopefully you remember back to microclass, which might be a stretch too. 
on the demand for beer and the supply of beer. If the demand for beer goes up, the price of beer goes up, right? So now we've got demand for bonds going up, driving up the price of bonds, therefore driving interest rates down. So just the opposite. So you got to remember that to flip that switch between interest rates and uh, the price of bonds. All right. Any questions on that? Okay. So. Um, this is called Keynes liquidity preference. Liquidity preference theory or framework. All right, so the key thing here is that it models interest rates, models interest rates from money market from the I got to be careful because sometimes in this class we really are talking about the money market uh, with uh, short-term bond instruments but here I mean uh, the, the demand and supply of money so models interest rates from the demand and supply of money All right, um, let's see, I did say notation again, yeah, so now we're gonna have the FD. All right, um, so if we think about money, where we've got the quantity of money now, and when we say money from chapter three, what are we referring to? Currency, yes. And what else? A little louder, Zach? And, yeah, that type of thing. Yeah, that's the type of money we're talking about. So currency plus checking accounts doesn't <laughs> plus if we go to M2. Money market accounts plus Currency, checking account deposits, that's M1. Money market accounts, savings accounts, right? So that's the main thing, as is the savings deposit. So um, when we think about money, we're thinking about currency and deposit accounts. So don't forget that. We got currency plus uh, bank deposits. like checking accounts, savings accounts. So we're thinking about the quantity of money that's out there in the United States. Okay. Why would we put the interest rate here? Why did Keynes put the interest rate there if we're thinking about the demand for money? I'll give you a hint, the demand curve is downward sloping. The demand for money. Why is the interest rate the price of money? Kind of weird now. You mean the price of me holding my money in my checking account or the the price of the price of holding on to the money day? Price of holding on to this guy here is that, right? Price of beer, quantity of beer. Price of bonds, quantity of bonds. Quantity of money, price of money? What's up? Opportunity cost. Same thing in econ all the time. We come back to what does it cost to be holding on to this? Now that we're getting into a little bit higher level, we didn't really do this in macro class. What are you giving up? What kind of interest rate are you giving up if you're holding this in your wallet? Bond. That's what Keynes was saying, right? Good job, Alex. So Keynes was saying we're going to be holding our wealth 
in the form of money, something very liquid. And in, in Kane's day, checking accounts just didn't pay interest. They still don't for business accounts today. So uh, for the most part, if you look at M1, there's virtually no interest being paid on M1. You get into savings account and there's a little pittance of it. But the, the general concept is that you're giving the interest that you could have been earning on a corporate bond or a government bond or something, right? So you're tying it up. So this, which asset is more liquid? This or this? Which one's more liquid? Money, right? And banking account deposits and all that. So the general public is holding their wealth, as, as Keynes put it, to kind of get this interest rate, is that they could be holding their money in the form of bonds, or they could be holding it this way. And so if you choose to hold this much money, you are giving up some amount of interest that could have been in the bond market. So his model uh, depends on that uh, decision being made of which one am I, uh, which direction am I heading with it. All right, so um, total wealth in the economy in Keynes' model was equal to your uh, bond supply and your money supply. So how many bonds are out there being held, which in equilibrium would be this amount, the quantity of bonds being held, and then the money supply which you might remember from macro class, is perfectly vertical. Why was that again? The supply of this stuff. <laughs> Why did we have it perfectly vertical? It means it's unrelated, right, to the interest rate, but why? It's fixed by who? The Federal Reserve, which a little bit later, we'll add on layers of detail later on that, but the Federal Reserve chooses how much of the stuff gets printed and put out into circulation through their uh, tools that they have. For this chapter, we pretty much just stick to thinking about the money supply. The supply of money is a choice variable by the central bank. They choose how much money to have out there. So we've got a vertical supply of money. So money supply and bond supply ends up being the total wealth of the economy. And so in equilibrium, uh, bond demand and money demand must equal the total wealth. And then that gives us this little um, little identity. If we bring the bond demand over here and the money supply over here, we get money demand minus money supply. So in equilibrium, money supply equals money demand, this is in equilibrium. So both of them, one drives the other, which allows us to think about the equilibrium in the two markets and how they're interrelated. All right, so let's see, we didn't write this down, but just go put on here, this is the opportunity cost of money is lost interest from a bond. We have the nominal interest rate here because it's the opportunity cost of holding money, the lost interest from a bond. All right, so money demand shifters. This is a little bit of review from macro, principles of macro class. Number one is an income effect. If there's an increase in income, big Y could be GDP for the country. Remember income, GDP, gross domestic product, the dollar value of all final goods and services produced within the nation's boundaries is equal to the 
income for the nation. Go back to our little handy dandy cheat sheets thinking about the global, maybe not even the global marketplace. Let's go back to the uh, simple marketplace. Buyers, sellers, households, firms, going to Applebee's and Walmart, the output market, right? They purchase stuff from the businesses, businesses supply goods and services, businesses or I'm sorry, households pay with their money, right? So that's total spending on final goods and services <coughs> in the nation. So that's our GDP. Downstairs, the businesses have to pay for all the resources that they use. All of the resources are owned by people, households, and so they supply land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship, and in return, they get paid wages, rents, salaries, and all the income of the nation. So at the end of the day, income in the nation equals the dollar value of purchases of final goods and services. So start to keep those in mind with the business cycle. If there's income going up, if people's income are going up, do people tend to hold more of this in their wallet or less? Think of this one, this one is okay for you to Think of yourself personal. If your income goes up, do you tend to have more of this stuff being held in your wallet or less? More. This is getting harder and harder for me to have this conversation in an increasingly cashless society because you're just thinking, I don't even use that stuff. It's so dirty. It's probably got cocaine on it. Do you know there's traces of cocaine on it? On most dollar bills. Have you guys heard that? Most money has little traces of cocaine and stuff. Like, I only use this stuff. This is money to me, right? So same thing, though. As you have more income, <laughs> how about the balance of your checking account? You're holding more money to spend, right? So whether you're thinking about your account, I think it's easier to think of cash. So let's say I have a preference for cash. Those of you who take personal finance with me know that uh, Dave Ramsey's a big cash guy, and so I, I, like, uh, I like using cash. You tend to hold more cash, and so that would tend to increase the amount of money you're willing to hold at each interest rate. At this interest rate, really high interest rates, like, oh crap, I better not be holding on to too much money, right? But now that I'm a rich guy, I'll still hold on to some money. Even at low interest rates, I used to want to hold on to this much currency, now I want this much. At this interest rate, I used to want to hold this much, now I want this much. And so it shifts the whole demand curve to the right, that you're going to hold more money at each interest rate. All right, questions on that? A little bit of review from macro, but I, I know we need to shake the dust off of that. So an increase in income leads to an increase in money demand. Number two, the price level effect. Price level effect. If there's an increase in the price level, does that cause you to increase or decrease your demand for money? This one's a little bit trickier. So with Prices going up, right? That's an increase in price level, an average increase in price. Level. In other words, it's inflation, right? So an average level of prices is tending to go up. Do you need to hold more money in your wallet, all other things equal, or less? Why? You're right. What's your reasoning for that? Because things cost more, and so you need more money to buy them with, right? So instead, I used to be able to buy something for 20 bucks, but now that there's inflation, I need 25 to buy the same good, right? So I actually have to hold all of the things equal. I need to hold more checking account deposits and more currency to buy the same amount of stuff. So that'll increase the money demand. If there's an increase in the price level.
All right. Um, let's see. Let's erase this. Oops, I guess I didn't need the last. Uh, money supply. Money supply shifters. Number one. There's more details to this, but at this point in the book, they're just going to keep it real simple. And that is <coughs> the Fed controls money. Federal Reserve Bank in the United States, our central bank. The Fed controls money. They are the shifter. So for this chapter, they're just going to say the Fed increases money supply. We're not going to get into required reserves yet and uh, changes in the discount rate and the things that we'll learn we'll do later. We'll add on that detail. So for right now, for the purposes of chapter five, I'm uh, just going to say the Fed controls money, so an increase in the money supply means a shift to the rest. Is this expansionary or contractionary monetary policy? Expansionary or contractionary monetary policy. Expansionary. Why? Flip a coin and yeah. that one sounded good? Yes. You know, sometimes in the econ class, the up arrow seems like it should be expansionary, but sometimes our gut goes the opposite direction. Is this one of those times? How many people are with Paige? Expansionary. Yes. Oh, you got lots of friend support. That's good. All right. So, expansionary monetary policy. Anybody want to jump in on why it's expansionary? We're expanding the money supply, so that part of it's right. Um, but also, what's going on then? If there's an expansion of the money supply, interest rate goes up, down. Look, trust, start to trust your graph here. I'll get up my magic golf club. Increase, shift to the right. Interest rates start to fall. Take me from there. Interest rate starts to fall. What starts to happen? Well, how does that change people's behavior? They spend more, right? They borrow more. They borrow more to spend, right? So they start uh, buying maybe more things. In, in, from a business perspective, businesses, if you remember, are the largest lenders. So in our our inventory of lenders that we did, maybe way back for chapter one or to uh, business were kind of our key borrowers. What are they buying with the cheap interest? What are they buying? Businesses. Capital. So capital in the economic sense, capital being machines, buildings, tools, things that help make other things. And so that increase in investment helps spur C plus I plus G plus X, it ends up being expansionary for the economy. So that starts to lead to cheap interest rates, both from the consumption side and the uh, capital side, lead to more, this one's probably better to look at, C plus I plus G plus X. Remember cigarettes? Our friend, cigarettes for GDP? G a little y here equals C, which stands for consumption. Good. So consumption, which is 70% of GDP, which is the final goods and services. Applebee's, Walmart, all the stuff on shelves at Walmart is pretty much all consumption goods. Uh, I investment purchases of computers, machines, and buildings. Capital purchases of capital by businesses. G Government spending, weapons of mass destruction, toilet paper for the White House, right? And finally, X, cigarettes, net exports. 
So net exports <laughs> meaning uh, the difference between what we sell to the rest of the world versus what we buy from the rest of the world. So our whole cigarettes is kind of captured here in terms of money from the firm. The firm goes in and pays that money in the form of income to all the resources that again are by the households. So Y equals C plus I plus G plus X. So reference back to that if you need to kind of look at the forest before we jump into more trees. We're getting to the level, since this is an upper level uh, econ class, that we're going to start melding some of those principles concepts uh, back and forth into the <laughs> higher level of detail. All right, so um, expansionary. I wanted to write that. So this is expansionary monetary policy. And this is an example. And a decrease would be a contractionary monetary policy and shift it to the left. Okay. Um, so here's the question. Under this framework, which will kind of let's see what I'll so, um, does a higher rate of growth is a higher rate of growth? of money supply lower interest rates. Question. Does a rate of growth of money supply lower interest rates? Now, when you see a question like that, is that a, sh that seems a little different than a shift to the right, maybe. Higher rate of growth. What does that really mean? Like, can somebody give me an example of what a higher rate of growth would be? Just using some numbers. But using rates of growth rather than a quantity of money. Yeah? Maybe a change from the previous year. Yeah, give me a percent. Throw one out. Uh, Just to have some numbers to work with. Five percent growth. Okay. Money supply from the previous year. All right. That it was. And so now we've grown to maybe seven percent, right? So the reason I wanted to say that is that both a five percent and a seven percent are both increases in the money supply, right? So it's a little bit weird, but you're going to see this kind of come out with rates of change being addressed versus the simple static um, supply demand that we look at here where this is just like, oh, it used to be 100 million and now it's an increase to 120 million, right? Using absolute numbers. If we talk about growth rates, it could be we used to do it at a 5% rate and now we do it at a 7% rate, right? So, the money supply is always growing. Um, that's part of the reason why we always have inflation. It's the fact that the premium quantity supply of money, uh, ultimately that seems to be the, the push. So we have a growing money supply. The mechanics of supply and demand though still apply that an increased rate of growth, conceptually you can just go ahead and think <coughs> that's gonna be moving this way faster, right? 5% growth rate versus a 7% growth rate. It's like it was going to move this way, but now it's going to move this way. See how I'm doing the speed of change, right? But the direction is still the same, so the impact is going to be kind of big change versus small change. All right, hopefully I'm not clouding that up more than, more than I need to, but I wanted to point that out. So does it lead to uh, lower interest rates? So answer, first of all, yes. Right? 
just money supply. But this is where the, the story starts to, to get a little bit more interesting. So, number one, we have an income effect. So, we've got more income because we had an expansionary monetary policy. If that worked, and it was truly expansionary in the form of GDP, what happens in the market? Demand goes up. So our income effect, which, yeah, I got right here, we have this going on. So we've got two things going on, and how are they working with each other? In concert together or opposite? The rate of growth of the money supply, the Federal Reserve increases the money supply, but then we've got this income effect. Working together or in opposite directions? Together, so together means interest rates go down with the money supply. What happens with the income effect? They go up, so they're working opposite of each other. So our prediction then is, what's gonna happen to interest rates? The answer is, I don't know. If this one shifted by more than this one, then the overall rate will come somewhere down. But if I might go up compared to our initial equilibrium starting place. All right, so that's uh, we got more. The income effect says we got more income from the increase in GDP, which leads to a increase in money demand. Number two, price level effect. <coughs> so, Money supply price level effect. So price level effect was over here, right? So we have this going on for income heading the same direction <coughs> with interest rates. Right? Because we had interest rates working in the opposite direction. So we need more money. We need more money to buy more stuff. Actually, to buy the same stuff. Buy the same amount of stuff. And so our price level effect is that increase in the money supply leads to an increase in money demand. How about expected inflation? Number three, uh, pi E effect. Okay. 
So an increase in the money supply does what for inflation? Expected inflation, I should say. Expected inflation in the future. Increase, right? So uh, again, we're not really relying on the quantity theory of money at this point, but we kind of remember that. Uh, increase in the money supply leads to a higher future price levels as well. So an expected price level increase. If prices are going to be higher in the future, what do I do today? Buy more today or more tomorrow when they're higher? Today or today. So there's an increase in money demand today. So all of these things have this uh, money effect, which leads to uh, unsure change in the overall picture. So therefore, and if the money supply has an uncertain effect on, this is kind of summarizing what we were doing since I didn't do any shifts, we're just kind of taking each one individually. An increase in the money supply has an uncertain effect um, on interest rates because of the increase in money demand, which happens at the same time. I didn't preview this ahead of time, that's why we might crash and burn on this, but I thought you guys look tired of listening to me, so what a figure. Figure 11. All right, here we go. Let's see what we got. Shows the response over time to an increase in money supply So 
we're starting to think about this in a dynamic sense, which is different than what we've done before. When we do the simple <laughs> supply and demand curves, it's like a slice in time, right? So now we're adding this dynamic element, and what we're tracing out is what are some potential uh, outcomes from the interaction of supply and demand. All right. An interesting response. Would like supply growth increases at time t. Time t. The income and price levels take longer to work because it takes time for the rise of the supply to raise the price level of income, which in turn raises the interest rate. The expected inflation effect can either be fast or slow, depending on how quickly the expected inflation changes when my supply growth increases. Now, we've got the uh, Federal Reserve uh, making their announcement next week. How quickly do markets react after Janet Yellen pleads her case on the outcome? How, how long? Immediately, yeah, about as quickly as they can in anticipation. Sometimes in the old days when we weren't quite as uh, I don't know how to say it, gender friendly, it was all males, the color of the tie of the Federal Reserve chair would sometimes trigger markets. They stick off if, if uh, Alan Greenspan had a blue tie on, then that meant it was going to be uh, a rosy signal for loosening up interest rates. But if it was a red tie, he was probably going to be holding it back. And so you'd actually see markets start to respond as the television came on and the appearance of the Federal Reserve Chair, what they looked like, some people would be hedging bets already and starting to make market transitions. So even before they spoke, they were trying to get, get stuff done. So that's what we're thinking about here is how long are these things going to take effect? The Federal Reserve is looking to do a quarter point at most probably, I think is what most people bet on. And the new bets out on Wall Street right now is they're going to hold pat. They're not going to change. Uh, by the way, I saw that you guys got uh, any, did anybody not get on? I kind of didn't pull it up immediately before class. It looks like a, anybody not get on the Wall Street Journal assessment thing. You're going to lose points, but you need to get on there. Okay. So that was due today. That was our homework problem. So make sure you get on there. Sydney, did you? Yes, sir. Okay. Who, so Matt and who else? All right. Sheldon? Anybody else? And then I was added to the class. Yep, that's all it was. I was getting email messages, but I just kind of lost track. And I, I can go to my thing. Yeah, it's just a free sign-up thing. Uh, because next week, you're going to be getting your first current events thrown at you. So you'll have a little quiz that will be generated from that sheet. So be ready for that. So those of you who aren't, if you need some help, Sheldon or Matt, then, but otherwise, everybody seems to be... It worked once I set the sec separate link. So how it's going to, well, for one thing, I'm kind of learning, but how it's supposed to work is that I'll assign a quiz on an article. And I can tell you already one of the articles is going to be on this interest rate uh, change coming up next week because there's a lot of current events that have been circulating around it. Um, and then you'll have like a 10-question quiz about the article. It's real simple. You just read the article, but it kind of forces you to read the article, otherwise you're not going to get it. And then that way we can have a healthy, robust dialogue in class because all of you hopefully will have read, read, the, <laughs> read the article. I'll have the. There'll be article links on there once we do. All right, let's get through. Let's get through this little guy here. So. Um, Again, there's, there's what we call policy lags with these decisions. So some things take longer than others. So the bond market, as I said, Wall Street's going to respond right away to Janet Yellen's comments. So the bond market's going to respond quickly, but the price level effect of how long does that take milk prices to go up? Federal Reserve increases the money supply. When do we start to see the price level change? Well. A, there's lots of other things going on. We don't know if it'll ever take effect. So I've been predicting increases in the price level for eight years now, and it still hasn't gone on because uh, other people are changing their behavior in non-traditional ways by hoarding money is what's been going on. So lots of different factors to, to analyze, but that's what this is looking at. So we're covering all three bases here of where we end up. So notice the dash line, I1, I2. 
I2 is above I1, I2, I1, right? So different ways that's changing. Candidate just like the case in which the liquid event is larger than the other events. The liquid event is a medium, and as a result, the interest rate immediately declines. Wall Street. However, over time, the income, price level, and expected inflation events kick in, and the interest rate rises. But to a level lower than I1 and I2, because the liquidity effect is larger than the other effects. Penalty has a liquidity effect smaller than the other effects, but there's slow adjustment of expected inflation. After the decline in the interest rate from the liquidity effect, the other effects kick in slowly, so the interest rate rises. But because the other effects are larger, the interest rate rises to I2, a level higher than I1. Tau C has a liquidity effect smaller than the expected inflation effect and has fast adjustment of expected inflation. As a result, the expected inflation effect kicks in quickly and immediately overpowers the liquidity effect. So, the interest rate immediately rises from I1. Over time, the price level income effects kick in, and the interest rate continues to rise, and eventually reaches I2. Which scenario holds true is important to policymakers, because if they want lower interest rates, the money growth should definitely be increased in the scenario of panel A, in which the liquidity effect is larger than other banks holds. While they should lower money growth, if the scenario in panel C is correct, in which the liquidity effect is smaller than the expected inflation effect, and this effect operates very quickly. If the scenario in panel B holds, in which the liquidity effect is smaller than other banks, but the expected inflation effect works slowly, then whether you want to increase or decrease money growth depends on how much you care about what happens in the short run versus the long run. All right, so that is that one. Now I got one more to show you. So don't back up here. One minute. This figure shows money growth and to an annual rate and interest rates on three month treasury bills from 1950 to 2014. The left hand vertical axis is the interest rate in percent at an annual rate, and it ranges from minus 12 to 32 percent. While the right hand vertical axis is money growth in percent at an annual rate and ranges from minus 8 to 28 percent. When the rate of money growth began to climb in the mid-60s, interest rates rose to unprecedented levels by the late 1970s, indicating that the liquidity effect is dominated by the price level, income, and particularly the expected inflation effect. The figure that supports either the scenario in panels B or C of the previous figure, but not panel A. However, the figure does not really tell us which of the panel B or C scenarios is valid? Because it does not reveal how fast the expected inflation effect occurs. All right, notice this one. Kind of an interesting part of our history right here. We're right in the midst of it. So this Fed decision Next week is starting to make this climb a teeny bit. We're still not even close. We've been in this for eight years now. Unprecedented over this 50 year cycle. All right, exciting times for money banking. We'll see you on Monday. You got uh, chapter five stuff, four and five or whatever. Look like most of you have been on my econ lab, but not all of you. So you might, some of you have more stuff to do this weekend than others.